All right. Welcome to our March webinar. I'll give a couple of seconds so that people can filter in um, now that it has been opened up. Let's see. Great, and I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so welcome to our webinar that we are having this month. Uh, we are calling it How to Run a Digital Transformation Project. Um, so this is going to be the second out of our four part series about the digital transformation journey um, where we did the last one uh, the previous month. Um, and as we go through here, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put the questions in the Q&A section. Uh, we have an, a, a, we'll do our best to try and get through them as we go along, but if we don't get to them, then uh, at the end, we'll have a question and answer section where we can go through and get them to there. Um, so first off, let me just kind of introduce a little bit about Macedon uh, so that we can get context on just exactly how we uh, came about this topic and where we got here. So at Macedon Technologies, we are expert practitioners in digital transformation. Um, over the you know, time that we have been in business for about 11 years, we have 100 plus clients and 450 plus engagements. And all of those different engagements that we have had have had all sorts of different you know, approaches to doing their agile methodologies, approaches to doing their development, different development tools. And so really that transformation process is something that we've gained a lot of expertise in just because we've seen it across so many different um, applications and environments. Um, and so uh, when we were trying to decide what our, our you know, transformation uh, webinar series were going to be, we wanted to try and kind of give it a little bit of context onto that whole journey. And so for the project section, I'll introduce the presenters that we have. So I'll start with myself. So I am Colin Schoenfelder, uh, the Director of Technology at Macedon. So I oversee our Center of Excellence and also all of our solution and asset development um, with us. So, and I've been around in, you know, for about 10 years doing a lot of implementation. Um, with me, I have Andrew Grauman, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Andy Grauman, I go by Andy. Um, Maston Technologies, VP of Professional Services. I've been with the company for a similar duration uh, as Colin, and I see o oversee all of our consulting engagements. Great. And then we have Alexandra Lang, if you would not mind introducing yourself as well. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Alexandra Lang, I'm a business process architect here. I go by Alex. And I've been here for about five years. I started out leading um, technical implementation projects, and now my role has shifted to focusing on helping clients identify and optimize their business processes, as well as empowering enthusiastic adoption of applications through change management plans. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving forward, um, wanted to do a little bit of a reset about exactly where we are in this process, right? So when we're talking about our digital transformation journey, the first webinar that we did in this series was really all about the preparation side of things. Um, so we were right here at the preparation side and we were talking about just the different agile trainings that you can do, discovery workshops and putting together an understanding of exactly what projects that you wanted to implement and getting an understanding of the process of how that implementation works. Now we are moving into the project section. And so when we're doing that, we're going to have a lot of focus on change management, expert implementation, and accelerators and plugins. But you know, when you're first starting that new project, certainly uh, there is a lot to consider. Um, and so I'll toss it over to you, Andy. Can you give us a little bit of just sort of uh, an understanding of what some of the goals that you're really trying to achieve on the outset with this project is going to be? Yeah. Um... So I, I love this phase. This to me is either my first or second favorite part of any project when you're just, you're, you're almost ready to go. Um, usually there's been a lot of investment up until this point to select a technology, to pick a first project, but you haven't gotten any value. And so people are really, really excited because they're finally getting ready to do something that's gonna make a change and, and deliver value for their organization. And, and I love that. Um, hopefully the project that was selected uh, is a good first project. And at Macedon, we have some defined, pretty well-defined best practices for, you know, when you're, when you're taking off on your digital transformation journey, picking that first little bite. Um, so hopefully we've got a project that's selected that, uh, you know, as an example, isn't too big, is pretty visible, um, is going to be implemented for a good group of excited people, but the risk of failure isn't, isn't too, too high. So if you're in that situation, the goals are pretty simple deliver some value and do it quickly, establish some credibility 
and then build some momentum as you take this first little successful project and you scale it up to that next level. It's, it's really all about making sure that you don't stop a project. You, you make it to program it, you know, for this, for this first one. Right. And as part of that, you know, definitely have been in this, you know, phase many times with uh, our customers of taking on that first project. And for sure, there can be a lot of apprehensions, right? Because if you've never done a project like this, it can feel very daunting. Um, Alex, can you talk a little bit about just some of the different apprehensions that customers might have as they're going into this and just sort of talk about sort of like that mindset for the organization? Yeah, absolutely. The first one that, you know, it seems most obvious to me is uh, a project's timeline, right? A project taking too long or not getting built in time. Um, you know, you're worried about your budget, you're worried about cutting over different systems and you want to get it done on time. Um, and that can come from, you know, a couple of different things. Maybe it's a lack of expertise or, you know, a lack of uh, understanding how to run a project efficiently right from the start. Um, so I'd say a project taking too long is usually the first apprehension to have, um, you know, when are they going to get it in their hands and get it into the user's hands? Um, the next thing is, you know, after you build a, a solution that is timely, is it a solution that is quality? So are you building a solution that is performant or, you know, is it you know, full of errors? Is Are there bugs there? You know, are you building something that's actually quality? Or are you building something that's not, you know, optimized and not uh, uh, scalable? Um, and the last thing is even if you build something on time and it's a really solid application, are your end users actually going to use it? And then that last category, you know, poor user adoption is something that I think often goes unthought about. Um, you're more worried about getting it done on time and getting it done well. You're not worried about people using it in the end. And I think that's, you know, another apprehension that um, you could have as well is um, poor user adoption. Right, yeah, exactly. And, you know, when you're talking about embarking on, you know, this process, you know, we really wanted to try and figure out what are some of the main you know, focus areas that you have in order to be successful here. And so between, you know, the change management expert implementation and accelerators and plugins brought Andy in, you know, for you to really talk about that ex or expert implementation piece, right? That's going to be the parts which are on the project or the implementation team. Alex brought you in to talk about, you know, that change management piece, which is really going to focus on what the organization is going to work on. And then myself kind of here to, to do some moderation, but then also to talk about how you can really make sure to accelerate things through, you know, the pre-built components that you might have and plugins that, you know, different um, uh, practitioners are going to bring to the table. Okay. Um, but so at, with those three focus areas, we thought that it would be helpful as we were going through this to really kind of like focus on the three areas, but talk about them in the context of what are you going, how are you going to apply them at the beginning, middle and end of the project, right? Um, and so how about we start off with Ali? Can you talk a little bit about um, at the beginning of the project, how are you going to really be focusing on change management within the organization and just sort of what are the things that you're actually practically going to be doing in order to be accomplished there? Yeah, so change management, I like to coin it as, you know, the people side of change. Um, and it's a lot of planning and assessment right at the beginning. Um, you know, creating plans and, you know, stuff like that. So the first really important part of change management at the beginning is sponsorship. So you really want to have an individual identified as someone who's going to champion this change within the company. It's going to be someone who gets people excited, someone who spreads awareness of it, um, you know, someone who is really just going to be there to champion your change and advocate for it. Um, they're easy to get in the beginning, I think, uh, but it's hard to keep them throughout the project and keep that level of enthusiasm really high. Um, so you want to meet with them, set that expectation early that they need to be there throughout the whole process in order for this to be a success. Um, the next one is that once you've secured a sponsor um, who's going to advocate for your change, you want to raise awareness early um, with all of the impacted user groups that are going to be using this system and need to do some type of change. So identifying who needs to change and making them aware of it really early. Um, instead of looking at the individual, next, think about the organization and the readiness of the organization for a change. We're in a really digital transformation heavy time right now because everyone's being remote and a lot of you know, companies are undertaking different projects. So you have to think, you know, is my organization ready for change? Do we have a lot of change going on? Um, you know, was there just a previous large change that people are still getting used to? Are they ready for another one to come down the pipe? Like, 
people can experience what we call change fatigue, um, and that will impact their ability to learn a new system and, and, and have this change be successful. So doing that type of assessment of organizational readiness is, is crucial um, when deciding you know, when to do this project and is this project right to do right now. And the last one I think is goal setting. So what that means is basically establishing a clear vision of what this project is and why you're doing it um, at a, you know, a business and strategic level. Um, and that will give you, you know, two things. It'll give you a vision throughout the project um, to keep everyone aligned on the same page as you're going through every decision you make. Is it building towards the original goals we set? And then at the end, it gives you a clear way to determine was your project a success? Um, so you're able to compare your outcomes and what actually happened with the objectives that you set in the beginning. So clear goal setting um, is the last one. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that you mentioned in there, you know, just sort of that change fatigue, right? Um, that's kind of, you know, very related to what we had talked about in, you know, the first webinar where, you know, people are very fatigued with those different, you know, pillars of technology that have developed over the course of the last 20 years as people have been, you know, doing a lot of, uh, you know, digitization of their old processes. So really, as we're going forward with this, it's about trying to make that a lot more holistic so that you can have, you know, much more effective change. Um, but all the stuff that you just talked about is all things that the organization is going to be working on, right? Um, so Andy, would you mind talking about a little bit of, you know, from the implementation side, like what's important in an implementation partner that they're going to come to the table with in order to be, you know, effective from day one? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'll broaden it a little bit and just say from an implementation spec perspective, what are you thinking of at the beginning of a project um, and, and what should you be doing similar to what Ali did? So, you know, taking a step back to the previous webinar in the preparation phase, you picked a project, right? You picked a technology, you've got an idea of what you want to do and the tool set that you want to, to accomplish it with. You're at the point now where you should be looking at securing the resources that are going to implement that technology towards that goal. Uh, chances are you're relatively new to digital transformation projects. You don't also want to have people that are new at the technology at the same time. That's going to that's gonna make that low risk project that we selected a lot higher risk. So look for resources that are credentialed in the technology that you have selected. Look for resources that have experience um, and, and in addition to experience, you know, other projects that they've executed on that same technology, ask them how those projects went. You want to select people with experience, with credentials that have a track record of success. And then the last thing that we think is important um, or that we've found has been important for folks embarking on a digital transformation, you pick technology resources that are comfortable serving in hybrid roles. Um, these projects are really interactive. Uh, if they're going to be successful, a lot of times they're really, really fast paced. And so you don't want to waste time going from product owner to BA to developer to project manager. You want somebody that can kind of speak the language of all of those different parties because they're going to be most efficient at taking your desired outcomes, turning that into software. And, and in a lot of cases, telling you why maybe your desired outcome is a little bit different than, than what they think it should be. Mm -hmm. So you've got your right resources, um, you got your team built up, now you want to establish how that team is going to work together. So establish your artifacts, um, establish the ceremonies that you're going to follow and the cadence that you're going to meet with each other. Um, you know, I don't care, I guess, what methodology that you use as long as it's interactive. Uh, we at Macedon use something that looks a lot like bread and butter vanilla agile because it puts a premium on transparency and also engagement with all of the different stakeholders. Um, and, and when you're trying to move fast, you're trying to do something quickly, you're trying to deliver value. I think that's really important. Um, and then finally, you've got your people, you've got how those people are gonna work together. Draw a box around the scope, you know, actually put together your detailed scope that you're going to try to accomplish in this, you know, this short period of time. Um, People have really big ideas, right? Remember, they're excited and it's a lot of fun, but you also have to bring them down to earth. And one tool that I really like is the story mapping tool. You, you kind of map out a process with uh, sticky notes on a, on a whiteboard. You know, you write the, the high level process steps and then down underneath those high level process steps, you write all the individual things that can happen. And then for 
finalizing that detailed scope, you can actually take a dry erase marker and circle it going down as low as you want. And then that circle right there, everyone's aligned on what you're going to try to accomplish over the next period of time. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, and, and then once you have your scope, your tech folks are going to want to start working on it. So actually, I'm going to kick it back to you, Colin. What are, um, what are some things that you've seen at the beginning from an accelerator's perspective that your tech folks are starting to do once, once they've been selected and, and we've identified the scope? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, a key point that you brought up, right, is that, you know, when you're dealing with your implementation team, uh, you don't want to have to deal with, you know, learning a new technology and also learning how to, you know, implement the project and implement um, the digital transformation at the same time, right? Like that is definitely setting up a lot on your plate, which, uh, you know, you're going to end up juggling. So when you're trying to choose somebody who is an implementation team who has been around for a long time and has seen all of these different types of applications, one thing that, you know, they will have is an understanding of a lot of the different very common patterns and a lot of the very, you know, common building blocks that all of these different applications are going to be made up of. Right. And, you know, it's kind of like in two different parts. Right. Because at the one hand, you know, you have all of the different applications, which, you know, might uh, even if you're using like a low code platform or something which is designed to vastly accelerate this pace at which you can deliver applications, you can still start yourself, you know, significantly further ahead if you have a number of different solutions which are going to, you know, get you there. Um, you know, in some cases, partners will have for very, you know, kind of like generic or common use cases, or, you know, verticals that they are working in a lot, different, uh, you know, almost complete solutions, right, that, you know, they can use to accelerate your development or get it to, you know, that 80% mark. Um, a little bit more commonly, it'll be something that is, you know, a very common design pattern that they can come back to and make sure that they are, you know, implementing all of that and kind of like using those different pieces uh, you know, together. So right at the beginning of the project, you know, you can take a look at what are the different building blocks that you have access to with that, you know, partner and figure out what's going to be appropriate in this, um, you know, environment right off the bat. You know, what are we going to be able to push our starting block to so that we can give ourselves the best, um, you know, position to move forward quickly. Um, and then I'll actually kind of, you know, that sort of continues a little bit and I'll sort of, you know, get a little bit into you know, the middle of the project now, because then you have the things which are a lot more generic, right? They are going to be components within any kind of application. So it might be things like UI components. And if you're talking about like particular ways of, you know, rendering calendars or news feeds or audit history, or even like reporting tools, which even in a low code platform, there might still be some things that you need to have on top of that, um, which can accelerate you even further. So not specific to any you know type of solution, but really something which is a lot more uh, generic and can be applied during the project. You know, as you're going forward and, and identifying, uh, you know, the things that it's going to be appropriate. But then also it could be things that are you know purely technical, right? Like if you have you know common systems that are you know integrated with, you know, having integration objects that they have done. Um, with that, or, you know, common, you know, different, uh, you know, like PDF generation tools, or, you know, different templating tools and things like that, that they can use, which are purely going to be on the background, um, but, you know, can be implemented and, you know, different uh, implementation teams are going to have those kinds of things available to them. So you can really, even if you're using like a low code platform, accelerate that development um, even further, right? And so, um, and now, you know, I'll kind of, you know, talk about that. So, now that we're sort of getting into a little bit more of the middle of the project, how on that implementation team side, Andy, um, you know, do you see them really taking advantage of and what are they going to be doing now that we're getting into that sort of iterative solutioning phase of the project, you know, like really the meat and potatoes of it? Yeah, um, so we picked, a, we picked a project, we picked a technology, we drew a box around the scope. Your creativity now is pretty much over it's not really true because your development team, you want them to be creative in how they design individual features, but from a project perspective and from a visioning perspective, you've got a short timeline. So don't, don't go crazy here. In fact, you should really systematize everything that you're doing from this point on, as far as your process is concerned. If you are going to go with an agile methodology, use people and put in place a process that, you know, is based on expertise that are the, of people that are used to running those types of projects, right? Do incremental planning the same way for each you know, sprint or product increment or whatever you wanna call it. 
do incremental feature refinement the same way every single time. Use the same templates. You agreed on which templates you're going to use and when it's going to do. Run those meetings the same time, the same way every single time. Your review process, you know, also within the product increment or within the sprint, looking at mockups, deciding whether or not the mockups are appropriate, asking for tweaks. Do that the same way every time along the same time frame. And then also do your end of sprint demonstrations the same way every single time. You know, this is what we plan to do. This is what we did. Here, let me show you. Do you have any feedback? Um, and then finally, you know, once you've gotten at the end of the sprint, do your validation the same way every single time according to the same time frame for every sprint, right? The functionality is now available. Please go test us and provide the feedback within the next number of days. Um, so that's it on the on you know kind of on the agile and running things. You also want to systematize the way that you're looking at your project health, and this is actually best done if it's outsiders looking in. Um, Macedon, we have a, our, our office of delivery excellence is awesome. Uh, Stacy, our director of uh, delivery and talent management, has come up with a project audit that has systematized the way that our team looks at every single project in our portfolio across 50 different dimensions. And what we're trying to do is flag things that we've seen in the past could indicate a problem is coming, right? It's, it's not like integrations are gonna slip. It's things like the product owner doesn't really feel empowered to make decisions by themselves and they have to go out to a committee of other people in order to give our team direction. Right? The team is getting that direction, but that situation is an indicator that if we do get into crunch time, we're not going to be able to adapt. Um, and, and so systematized looking from the outside in at some of those uh, key success indicators or, or you know, potential risk factors um, and then incorporate that in. And then finally, you, you know, you're executing the same way according to the same um, methods and procedures every single sprint. You're looking at that project from the outside in and you've systematized the way that you do that. Now communicate that to every party involved the same way, the same time on whatever your reporting period is. We like to do weekly risk and escalation executive status meetings on our projects. Just bring the project sponsorship in. It can be 15 minutes if nothing's going wrong. We have the forum to make it longer if something is going wrong. Um, and we just we make sure that everyone's on the same page at the same time so that you know th th there are no surprises. Right. And I think that, you know, all of that work on the implementation team, them having the expertise on how that project actually runs, right? How to do that delivery and to, to grow out, you know, the application. Um, but on the organization side, um, Alex, I'm hoping that you can talk a little bit about, you know, this is going to be a really important time for, you know, them as well to just prepare for the change. What kinds of things are they working on from a change management perspective in the organization so they can be successful moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, tying actually really nicely into having these, um, you know, the implementation meetings you were talking about, Andy, a lot of the, you know, demos and things like that, that ties into stakeholder engagement. So I'll define engagement for us as involvement and influence. So it's not just inviting, you know, the stakeholders into these refinement meetings or, you know, these demos, it's actually getting their influence in these meetings, right? Having them give their feedback, having us, you know, listen to them and actually take into account, you know, what they want to see in this application. Um, we'll do, you know, it'll continue the awareness of what's going on, what's the status of the, you know, the project, as well as help create a desire to actually use it. You know, they're getting it in front of them, they're getting excited about it, they feel like they're contributing to it, and, you know, they are contributing to it, and it's going to have them, you know, build that excitement, and, and it's going to ensure that lasting, you know, implementation once it goes live. Um, and the next thing is active communication. So this is like your communication plan, I would say. Um, and internal marketing, right? So you want to keep everyone on the same page about the change. And a good way to do that is, you know, it's multifaceted and it's first coming up with key messages, right? What do you want to tell people about this project? Um, you know, give it the what's in it for them, right? Help people understand how it's going to give them value in their daily life, as well as how it's going to give the company value. Um, and, the, and the next part of that is identifying the correct sender and the right receiver. So it makes sense to me to send strategic messages, right, from the executive level. So I want to hear business strategy announcements and key messages from execs, right, from the higher ups. But if something's affecting my day-to-day -day life and I need to change something I'm doing at a lower, you know, more tactical level, 
that should come from, you know, my direct manager, my direct superior. So it's not just, you know, sending out mass emails saying, oh, change is coming, change is coming. It's taking the time to craft a creative, you know, plan that helps people understand things and get different messages from different people um, in order to fully understand what the change is, why it's happening and, and build that enthusiasm and awareness for it. Um, next thing is, establishing metrics for your project before you actually go live. During this, you need to figure out what you want to see at a quantitative level once this project is live for three months or six months or a year. You know, what kind of return do you want to get and how are you going to say um, that you're actually seeing it? Um, and in addition to having those metrics, whether you're reducing, you know, 20 business hours a month on, you know, across a team, you need to assign an ownership to that metric. So make sure there is someone at the company accountable for this direct result and then build a plan around it, um, you know, build a contingency plan to say, hey, if this metric isn't met, here's what we're going to do. And, and it's not just having the metric, but it's having the ownership of the metric that will help that actually be realized and help the value be realized um, if you aren't seeing what you're expecting. And the last thing, it's again, it's people oriented, but it's you know a hybrid of people and process oriented. It's, it's the training plans. Mm -hmm. So you wanna give the stakeholders the support they need during this change, um, you know, once you go live. Basically you need to identify two things. What do they currently know and what do they need to know? And the gap between those two things is where you're gonna target your training plans. So if, if you have a bunch of users that are brand new to Appian, you need to give them Appian training or whatever technology you're about to be introducing to them. Like they need to know how to use it. If you're changing a process and removing some steps or, you know, adding a new team in there, you need to make sure that there is training on what the new process is, right? So no training plan is going to be identical across any project. And you need to really put in the time to identify, again, what they know versus what they need to know and, and build that plan for them. Basically, the goal for all of this throughout the iterative solutioning phase you want your users to be up and running the day you go live. You don't want it to be weeks and weeks later. You want them to be using it to maximize the value of the project on day one. Right. And, you know, that is plays such a huge part into that adoption piece, right? Because it's, you know, if you feel like you have this sort of gray area where you're not exactly sure what process you're supposed to be following, then, you know, that's exactly when people start to get frustrated and they don't have, you know, correct adoption and you don't see the kind of value that we're really hoping to get out of the system. Um, but at this point, you know, we're really starting to get into the end of the project, right? So we are about to go live. We're coming up to, you know, the end of the project. Um, Andy, can you talk about from the implementation team perspective, like what are the kinds of things that they're going to be using to get ready for that particular go live? Yeah. Um, so there are a million different things that can go wrong at this stage of the project. And all of them have happened before. There's, there's no new things that we're ever going to see that can go wrong at the end of a project. We've seen all of them. I, IT service providers have seen all of them. And the reality is none of them are very complicated, right? So, you know, users are not in the system when we turned it on and asked them to go log in. Permissions, they're in the system, but the permissions aren't set up correctly. The network is not configured appropriately for the end users or for the systems that need to each talk to each other. The list goes on and on, right? Performance and load testing was done, but it wasn't done based on the expected load and data volume. The data wasn't migrated, right? Um, the point is, is that all of these things have happened before. They're going to happen again, and you should just put all of them in a checklist to make sure that you have done them and then check all of the little boxes on the checklist before you go live. And that's really what this is all about, right? Just make sure that all of the excitement from that beginning phase and all of the great hard work that happened doesn't, you don't lose your momentum because you didn't check, tick a, you know, a little box on a checklist that, you know, really isn't very complicated. That's, that's what I'd say towards the end. And, and it's in the same theme as systematizing your delivery, right? Just mm -hmm. do it the same way every single time, check the boxes before you go live. Right. <laughs> Exactly. And so then, you know, from that side on the implementation side, so Alex, can you talk about on the change management side, what's the organization going to be doing on that, you know, that first go live when they're actually in the system and, you know, starting to use it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we talked a little bit about metrics earlier. So I would say the first thing they're going to start doing is depending on the timelines that they gave those metrics, start, you know, monitoring them and, 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 seeing are we getting the return that we're expecting right and this this might not happen right away this could take weeks or months depending on what improvements they were trying to see 
um, but start monitoring those, you know, right away. Um, how many people are in the system? Is everyone using it? You know, things like that uh, right early on. And then, you know, are we seeing the number of things we're looking to see reduced or improved across time, you know, monitoring those and then employing those plans to, you know, mitigate anything going wrong um, as needed across time. And then, so I guess I had just mentioned, um, you know, are all the users using it um, right on go live? So if you are seeing that there is some resistance and resistance is sneaky, resistance isn't just someone outwardly saying, I don't want to use this. It could be someone very quietly saying they don't want to use this, right? Or just, or talking to, you know, talking to their employees and not actually, you know, talking bad about the application or something like that. Things that you don't see from a very high level, um, are things you need to try and reduce. And how do you reduce things you can't see? Well, you ask for them, right? So opening up feedback loops to the users is really, really important. And it's not just sending out a survey. It could be a really casual conversation with someone, or it could be, you know, it could be that type of survey, right? It's just opening up creative um, and really varied ways of getting feedback. Um, because you could find it, I've seen situations where there are users who all have the same very, very small annoyance with this with, with the single application. And because we weren't actively asking them for their feedback, it just went unsaid and people were kind of frustrated all the time, right? With a very small annoyance. But as soon as we gave them a very casual, open, comfortable meeting to talk about it, they one person spoke up and then everyone spoke up and then and we, we got that fixed very quickly right after go live. So it's a matter of not just waiting for feedback, but asking for it. Um, and that's really important. Um, and the next thing you can do if you're not, you know, in order to make sure everyone feels like they should be using this new application in addition to raising awareness and training is setting a good example, right? It starts from the top. So you need have, everyone needs to be using the application and, and it's gotta start at the top. If I see my manager, you know, using this new application and really pushing for it, like I'm going to feel empowered to use it as well. So it's, it's, it's not all on the individual. You, if you do have influence in, in your company, you should be setting that example. It's, it's really on you. Um, if you have the ability to have influence, you should be executing it um, by setting a good example using the application. And the last one that I think goes unnoticed a lot and I find really important is celebrating the success of the launch whether it's across the whole company or maybe just you know with the development team, whoever you need to celebrate with, it should be everyone. Um, you could have multiple meetings for this, but it's gonna build morale. It's gonna build morale for your dev team, for your IT department, for everyone that's using the new application, um, you know, for your sponsor, and it's gonna build momentum. It's just gonna help bring us from a project to a program, which is kind of you know, where, where we wanna go, right? So we wanna build the morale and build the momentum for the development. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's important to remember, like at this part of, you know, your engagement, you're really only halfway through, right? So like, if we take a look at, you know, our um, plan that we were, have been going through, you know, we are exactly at the middle of this project. We are here. So when you're first going live, you still have, you know, the program that you're going to go into. Um, and as you're starting to prepare for that, you know, that's when, you know, at least from sort of the accelerator's perspective, right? Like that's when you're starting to look inward. You know, what sort of things have you built out already as part of this that you want to continue to reuse as you go forward? You know, really trying to avoid that, you know, that pillars of technology, right? Where everybody has this disparate understanding of exactly how they're going to use the system. Now is where you're gonna to wanna to start taking a look at, okay, well, from a technical perspective, what are the things that we're going to be able to reuse? Like, are we integrating with, you know, our main CRM tool for this? You know, we want to make sure that that is well encapsulated so that we can, you know, reuse it for all of the different other projects that are probably going to have to access the same kind of data. You know, you can start to look at what are the different UI standards that we have been using across this application and making sure that that is, you know, codified somewhere or just, you know, cataloged somewhere so that the next app or project team that's coming in is able to use those same standards and you can avoid creating this disjointed feel of the application where everything is sort of in these separate pillars and you have to have individual trainings for each one of them because they're so completely different. You know, as you would, uh, or developing out your applications, you want the amount of training that you have to do in order to get onboarded with one, you know, further programs to be less and less and less and less, right? Because people are going to just start feeling like this is one integrated system that they're using across their entire platform. And, you know, 
Also, this is where you're going to want to start setting up like, you know, a center of excellence for this kind of information, a center of excellence for, you know, your uh, technical, um, you know, requirements and just like technical components that you have, but also just, you know, from the UI and perspective and to make sure that you're getting as much out of the work that you have already done as you possibly can as you're moving forward. Right? Um, and so with that, I think that we're actually um, pretty much to the end of our presentation. I want to go through and take a look at some of the questions that we have. So let me bring those up. Uh, okay, so we have a few questions. I don't know if we're going to be able to get through all of them, but I'll try and... Um, so the first one, I, I think that this one is... How do you deal with someone who is very set in their ways and anti-technology? Um, I, I think maybe I'll direct that one over to, to Alex. So how do you deal, I guess, you know, with someone where I suppose just like the group of people that are just very resistant to change just generally? Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen this, we've seen this many times. People are very set. They like, you know, printing out pieces of paper and using them, you know, to get their job done or whatever. And I would say, even if you've already actively you know, tried to build desire and um, create awareness for it, you need to get to the root of the issue, right? The theme I'll always say is seek first to understand and then be understood. So you need to ask them in, in a comfortable setting, not a confrontational setting, what, you know, what, what, what their issues and their concerns are, and maybe, maybe what their fears are. Like they, maybe they fear that this new technology is somehow going to replace them, right? And they have to understand that this is going to help them, right? We're, we're building things to help them. And, it's hard to listen when you don't feel heard. So you can't just go in there and say, you need to use this because we're changing and there, you know, there's no buts about it, right? You need to understand them, you know, employ that empathy, right? Understand, understand them at a very individual personal level um, to, to hear their concerns and then, you know, go from there, right? Involve, you know, the necessary trainings or meetings that you need to have in order to help them, um, you know, kind of get out of their ways and see that this actually is going to be beneficial for them, help show them the what's in it for them, right? But only after you've, you've understood where they're coming from. Cool. Um, the next one, I suspect I'm going to route to Andy. So I, I think that is probably from when we were talking about the different like risk management in the, in the middle of the projects. But how do you manage a road, or I'm sorry, not that one. Um, how do you combat risks that aren't directly related to the project? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I'm trying to think of a couple examples. Um, maybe you've got, maybe you're building a solution and it's integrating with some other technology that's out there already. And there's a team that's responsible within this organization for delivering all integration services, right? They've got a backlog, they've got a list of things, they've got prioritization, um, and maybe someone on their team gets sick, right? Their capacity goes down and, you know, as far as they're concerned, prioritization stays the same, but everything gets pushed out because their capacity is down now. You can't really prevent that, right? But you can build resiliency into your schedules to handle those types of things. Um, the other thing that you can do, and I encourage you to do, and, and one of, another reason that we really like Agile, being a transparent methodology, um, it, you're, you're going to, over time, build a network of stakeholders for your project that are interested in your project, but aren't necessarily directly involved. And so if you've got external risks that are putting pressure on your delivery and your timelines, you also have a network of external stakeholders that you can leverage to address those risks, right? And, and it may very well be that when you go up or over to talk to folks who can help you address these external risks, it may well be that the prioritization decision is the prioritization decision. But since you went up and over and raised it to them already, um, you have a little bit more leeway to adjust the way that you're going to deliver your project and still get to an outcome that everyone's gonna be, first of all, not surprised by, and second of all, happy and excited about. And you know, it's, it can still be successful, right? So that's what I would say. Um, you know, understand that those things happen, build resiliency in. If you have a methodology that allows you to adapt, you can do that. And then, um, you know, don't, don't hide it. Use your network and, and, and don't try to solve a non-project problem with only project resources. Use other resources that you have to your advantage. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and I don't know, Alex, if you have anything else to, to kind of contribute to that one. Um, it's definitely yeah. something just about, or sorry, go ahead. No, sure, sure, sure. Just Andy, I, I loved all of the high level, like a strategic, you know, transparency, flexibility, you know, having that network outside of your project is really important. Um, just a couple things, like at a very small, you know, tactical level, low level, um, assigning ownership to it, whether it's someone who's on the project or not, like making sure that there's someone accountable for this issue. I find that to be very helpful. You can't just let it say, oh, it's all of our problems, like then it's nobody's problem. So, you know, having someone accountable for the issue, maybe putting putting some bounds around it, like, you know, making sure you have a clear definition of what the problem is, whether it's part of the project or not, and then setting a deadline. I would say is also really helpful. So making sure there's accountability, there's a bound around the time of when you want to get it resolved. Um, again, regardless of if it's project related or not, and, and having a clear definition of it is really important as well. Absolutely. And then the final one that I think that we'll have time for to talk about today, um, definitely talking about just sort of that change fatigue that we had talked about a little bit earlier. So I think Alex, this is a good one for you as well. Um, how do you manage a roadmap of many projects without subjecting your um, entire organization or your employees to change fatigue. So we talked a little bit about change fatigue before, but I don't know if there's anything else that maybe we can add to that. Yeah, absolutely. So traditionally building roadmaps, you have a bunch of different projects that you want to get going down the pipe, right? Um, you have a lot of big ideas and you, you know, a lot of plans and you're ready to go. And what are you taking into account when you're building a roadmap? You're taking into account the technologies Maybe, um, you know, if we have like three or four different Appian projects lined up, we're going to, you know, put those in order because we want to have a contract, you know, with the Appian developers for a certain amount of time. Um, but what often doesn't go into account is the people that are impacted by these projects. So if you have, you know, at the beginning, if you are doing what you're supposed to be doing with each project and identifying which groups are going to be impacted by this change, you'll be able to then have a view of, hey, the finance department is going to be, you know, affected by three of these four projects. Like we need to give them, we need, we need to order this in a way that doesn't just make sense based on the technologies, but based on the people that are going to be using it as well. And are they going to be going through training for all of these? And are they going to be learning new processes? So in order to reduce the change fatigue, I think you need to build a roadmap using more um, pieces than just, you know, the technology and the timeline. You need to also take into account that third piece, which is the impacted groups by the projects that you're doing. I think that's that's a good way to combat, you know, change fatigue when building out a roadmap. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I think that that is going to wrap up our presentation. I'll remind you that this is the second out of the four part series that we are going to do on uh, the digital transformation journey. So uh, look forward to in the next you know couple of weeks our announcement for when we are going to do the third part, which is really transitioning into that program level. Um, this recording will be available on our YouTube, so make sure to just row on over there and get to that uh, into that YouTube, and you can check out the the previous ones that we've done before. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Alex and Andy, for uh, attending with me, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you for hosting, Colin. Thank you, Colin.